Welcome aboard on a Thursday night. It's the A Game. I'm Rob Akampora from the Shared Universe Studios on the Jersey Shore, the home of Ming Chen and Mike Zapsik from Comic Book Men. Uh, that's, that's two guys this guy actually knows. He, and, and the scary part is Keith and I have a lot of familiar connections with each other, yet first time that we are meeting up with each other here. And to give him a proper introduction, I want to just take this from his Twitter feed. Husband, actor, writer, producer, documentary, feature director, skip tracer, medic, wet nurse, zombie hunter, squirrel enthusiast, tour guide, himself, Keith Coogan. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, bud. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, guys. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. You know, since we are bringing up the fact that on your Twitter feed you have husband first before actor... I figure it'd just be appropriate to uh, recognize the fact that uh, photo number two, uh, Christian, uh, you and your wife, Pinky, there you are. I think you guys have been married almost eight years. When did you guys first meet, by first. the way? Oh, I met my wife at an uh, autograph convention. It was my <laughs> first autograph convention ever. <laughs> and uh, I was reticent to do them. I was like, God, don't you just feel like a whore standing on the corner as people throw 20 bucks at you? So... Um, I warmed up to it. I saw how much the fans really did appreciate me people and stuff. So I was into it. And I met her, and we um, love at first sight. Fantastic. Fantastic. You don't expect to figure that the convention would be the thing that would bring the two of you together. I mean, and you guys were – how long were you together before you got married? Yeah, now. Yeah. And uh six months uh, we well we were yeah really because uh, we kind of didn't really see each other for another couple of months and then we went to chiller convention uh, and that uh, we got engaged at chiller in jersey <laughs> oh wow the ties to jersey run very Persephone. deep with this man that's funny because i mean you've got some deep jersey ties and some other things that we're going to get into uh during this podcast but uh, congratulations on that i'm just glad to bring up the photo and um now I can at least go from husband to actor. And, jeez, where do I start with all this? I think the best way to start is, like, we got to go back to the beginning. Um, Christian, if you would do me the favor and give me photo 12, let's go back to, I'm guessing, what are you, eight here, seven or eight years old, Keith? Let me see. Uh, Walton, so I am eight, turning nine. Yeah, that was the eighth season of Walton's. That was like the first real big break. I mean, you were doing some things, but that was the thing where you got this long arc on the wall. I'm carrying Harold. Mm-hmm. And it kind of gave the first real big-time attention to you. And at that point, yes. another interesting story. I mean, it will... go ahead. Well, yes and no. Uh, I've loved the Waltons, and they're a great uh, group that brought me in as a family, really. Um but it was the tail end of the Waltons run. So we're talking the last second to last season. And so there might not have been any kind of viewers or a boost. Mm. I think at the time people were saying, you know, the Waltons isn't kind of run its course. There's no more John boy. Grandpa had passed away. Um, other cast members were having salary issues. So I really shouldn't be talking about this <laughs> stuff, but um, I had, uh, it was, it was a very good boost. It's solid. I'd done a couple of series or did it only run a few episodes? So um, I appreciated it. And yes, I did continue to work in a lot of television after that. I think I got offered Love Boat shortly after I got off of the Waltons. There was another good break that came your way, but it was in a different way. And uh, to be immortalized in a Disney cartoon has got to be one of the coolest things, especially at a young age. Give me photo 13, uh, Christian. The Fox and the Hound is a classic from the Disney reign. And there you are, you know, sending your voice talents with the likes of Mickey Rooney and Kurt Russell and Jack Albertson and uh, Sandy Duncan and even Corey Feldman. I mean, I mean, when you look back on that experience, I mean, was that a lot to take in as a kid to just kind of go, OK, by the way, uh, we're going to tell you that you're going to be this character and you just got to sit on the mic and just kind of, you know, act your way while watching the cartoon, I would imagine. No, you always record the voices first. As a matter of fact, they trotted me and Feldman in front of the animators so they could basically have Fox and the Hound look like them and, and behave like them. Um, and we took time. It took several years, you know, a couple of years to do the voices because they would do a bit, animate a bit, then do some more voices. They wanted us to kind of grow up within that first half of the movie. 
Don Bluth left production, took half the animators from Disney with them, so they had to rehire, retrain, and kind of half start over on it. It uh, extended production into 81. I was well aware what being in a Disney movie was all about. Very stoked. Um, Disney had lost some of its sauce by that point. And uh, so it was right. We started, it was the last Disney film that had the original nine old wise men that had done Snow White and Pinocchio. Right. But it also had a new brand of guys that had all gone to CalArts, uh, Brad Bird, Tim Burton, John Lasseter, uh, et cetera. So I worked with the new new breed of animators and the the classic legendary breed. That's cool, and not many people can say that you had that. And it was the, yeah. the most expensive Disney film, animated film up to that point, um, at ten million dollar budget. Million but dollars, it phenomenally yes. well. It also made more money than any animated film had at that point for Disney. That, you see, that's interesting. I would I would imagine back then when we talk about ten million dollars. That you know, in 1981, I'm sure Disney's looking at them like, going, "You're going to do what? And it's going to cost what?" But again, the the results speak for themselves. It is now how many years later? It's a true classic. We we started in '78, and it took three years. Well, to get I, it done. I did not know that. And obviously, animation now can be done a lot quicker Thanks. with the technology, but. It, that's wild that it. But again, we're talking like you said, old school meant new school. So you don't realize it takes that long to do an animated film back then. I never realized. Yeah, and I like that it's uh, it still holds a place in people's heart. I think it's kind of punishing for kids. There's some great uh, reaction videos online of parents making their kids watch Fox and the Hound, <laughs> and they just cry. Why is she dropping the fox <laughs> off? But they're friends, and it's just great. It's like totally cruel to do children, but it's a pretty heavy little movie with some great themes so i'm very very proud of fox of the hound good stuff with keith coogan here on the a game um the film that kind of launched his career even though it's not the film that's getting the most attention right now and i'll explain a little bit more when we get there but uh christian if you would there is a little poster we can put up here if you give me photo number 15 and this film by the way was recently on cable i actually caught it recently on hbo and i was like oh god you remember just how much fun the movie was and and if you look at the photo there's elizabeth shoe and holding on to elizabeth in cartoon form there maya bruton and there's keith and then underneath him anthony rapp who's now a trekkie by the way good for him he's doing very well good to see him doing that when you look back on that film i mean and you're smiling which is great so obviously it does bring back some good memories and you look back on the the ride that it was filming that yes Sick. all right there we go again we're gonna have a little bit of a delay so bear with us as we uh, get back to where we were here and we were talking about adventures and babysitting uh, with that in mind and i'm gonna recognize that mug in a second too we gotta talk about that but i was saying with adventures and babysitting when the minute i brought it up you were smiling right away so obviously very fun memories going on with that movie what, what comes to mind when i say that adventures and babysitting to you a lot of night shoots um we shot mostly in Toronto uh, mm -hmm. for two months and uh, quickly moved into nights. There's just a few scenes shot during the daytime. So it was gr it was a long shoot, uh, probably three months total. Then we moved to uh, Chicago and got a lot of kind of landmark things in Chicago, the expressway and uh, uh, along the riverfront and stuff um, that kind of just had to be shot in Chicago, the right. blues bar. Uh, and then we came back to L.A. for a week of special effects. We used uh, Intravision, which is uh, front projection. They used it in The Fugitive and Stand By Me and Outland with Sean Connery. Great film. Um, and I think Intravision only existed for a small window of time. So not a lot of movies were shot with this process. Uh, and it was it came out quickly. We shot it January, February, March. This thing was released July 1st. Um, which is fun because everything was done in camera. Right. There was no effects. There was no matte paintings. There's no blue screen. Intravision is it shows up in dailies ready to be projected. And Chris Columbus found an amazing, you know, blues and uh, score mm. uh, preventing really because so many artists and different labels have prevented a really official soundtrack to come out. Wow. Uh, but the music is fantastic in that film. Uh, including the babysitting blues, uh, <laughs> which was a three day shoot. Um, no, two day shoot on the babysitting blues. We had a, a day of recording it in a studio and then the next two days we recorded it. Um, and huge amount of press, 
uh, PR for it, uh, support in television ads, news full, you know, two page spread in the LA Times. I saw this like full color spread, and I'm like, oh, they're pushing this movie. Yeah. And they increased theaters second weekend, and it, the box office went up, um, which is, uh, you know, it can happen. If you do a, a theater increase, it can happen. Yeah. Um, and it had legs. It stayed in theaters for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, and then gratefully, and this is something Curtis um, Armstrong had said, booger. <laughs> he said, there's two levels of luck. There's luck that you get in a movie and you do a movie. Yay, you got a movie. The second layer of luck is it's something that people are going to be watching 30, 35 years from now. It's true. That's that's well said. And, and since you bring up Curtis Armstrong, not just Booger, let's bring up the fact that he was brilliant in the film, Ray. I didn't even recognize him at first, but then I saw it and went, wait a minute, it's Booger. What's he doing in this book? And he was great. He played that role so well. Yeah, he's quite sharp, and he's a great speaker. If you ever get a chance, he's promoting his book. You get a chance to see Curtis speak. He's worth every second. I'm going to mark that down for sure. Keith Coogan's here on the A-Game. Uh, from Adventures of Babysitting, um, there was another movie that I, this is this is sort of like my kind of personal, like, it pops up, I have to watch it. And it wasn't like, it wasn't a huge film, but it was this, well, let, let me get the poster up because we actually got the foreign poster of this. Uh, photo 16. And this is a film with John Cryer that you did called Hiding Out. And this is actually, I think, the German poster. This is that incognito, as it says there. But, you know, Maxwell Hauser and him trying to hide from the law. I mean, it was a cute premise. It was one of those films where I look back and I go, you know what? I got on the ride. I had fun on the ride. It was it was just, you know, it's not like I'm going to say it was a huge movie, but it was definitely one of those, if you've never seen it, go watch it. You're going to be entertained. You're going to have fun. You go on a ride with it for sure. There was a lot of high concept stuff in the 80s where you can describe a movie in a sentence. Oh, babysitter, you know, took care of her charges in downtown Chicago or stockbroker on the run from mob hides in high school. So if you can explain a movie in one sentence, mm -hmm. it would be sold in the 80s. I later learned after reading John Cryer's book that he put that movie together, found the material, found Marty, got the script, had Marty come on and co-produce. Uh, they got uh, De Delorentis Entertainment Group behind it. Dino Delorentis. De yes. Come on. Mm -hmm. Legendary filmmaker. Big time. Um, shot in Wilmington, North Carolina. Another like two and a half month shoot. Uh, and a weird, it was directed by Bob Giraldi, who is infamous for having you know shot the Pepsi commercial with Michael Jackson when his hair caught fire. And Bob was a hoot. It was just a fast fury. We had far too little money to do it with. And it was a very ambitious thing. It creates its little universe. Mm -hmm. Absurd, of course, but took itself seriously enough to go, here's thriller, here's comedy. And I was very glad to be just part of the comic relief. And John was the hardest working person I've ever seen on set. That's the reputation he's had from uh, Two and a Half Men, too. So it's good to hear he's had that whole ethic pretty much his whole career. Now, from there, let's see. Now, this is interesting because the next two films I'm going to talk about, it's the 30th anniversary year on they both of these films. They Two and a Half Men on stage 26 at Warner Brothers, which is the same stage that the Walton's house was for the Waltons. I did not know that. That's cool. I did not know that at all. All right, 30th anniversary year that we're going to talk about with these two films. Uh, one was April 26th. It happened earlier this year. The other one was actually this week, but uh, we'll go in <laughs> chronological order here. Um, give me uh, photo number one, if you would. Toy Soldiers is one of those things that um, love the concept. You know, it's it's one of those, okay, everybody who's ever gone to school would be like going, look, that's it. We're going to take everybody down. But, again, being held hostage, great cast, Will Wheaton, Arlie Ermey, who I was always a fan of, Louis Gossett Jr., the actor's actor, Denham Elliott. If you don't know Denham Elliott, you know him from Trading Places being the butler there. So fun cast, good concept. I, I get the feeling, I've seen some photos on uh, Twitter on your page. There was actually a photo with you and Will Wheaton. I would imagine you made some good friends that have kind of carried over the years off, off of that film. Of course. Uh, uh, first of all, Sean Astin is family because his father and my grandfather were uh, Gomez and Uncle Fester, Fester in the original Fester. 64 series. Yes. So I've known Sean since we were kids. Um, and I've been friends with Mac and Mackenzie. 
Uh, so it was like, hey, Sean, how you doing? You know, hey, we're, <laughs> we're, we're finally doing a movie together. Um, and Will, I'd been friends with Will Wheaton. Um, I well, ultimate respect for Lou Gossett Jr., by the way, who's just the man. Yes. But uh, did you mention the credit for Denim Elliott? Indiana Jones, Raiders oh. of the Lost Ark. I don't know if you mentioned that. I did not. Like okay, that. you you, you got me on that. You got me. The version of Brody <laughs> that was now, it was at the university, but after Indy. But anyway, the whole backstory that that was actually Brody. Keith Coogan here on the A game. All right, let's go to, as I'm looking at my photo list. You're blocking my photo list, Christian. You're killing me. Yeah. You're killing me here. <laughs> I got to set it up because we're going to talk about the 30th anniversary of this, but it also ties into something that is going to be happening very soon. So give me photo number six. Because Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dad just celebrated its 30th anniversary within the last week. Now, I don't know if this is sort of interesting timing, but Keith will be making an appearance at the New Jersey Horror Con and Film Festival in September. And the cool thing about this one is that it's sort of a semi-reunion because you also have two other of his castmates joining him. One, Joanna Cassidy, who played Rose and currently has got a recurring role on NCIS New Orleans. And Daniel Harris, who played Melissa. And she's become sort of the modern-day scream queen. So she fits this perfectly. This is going to be, I think, a lot of fun to do. And like you said, you've done these conventions before, so you're obviously into them. But to have that little mini reunion of the movie, I mean, that's got to be a nice surprise. Yeah, it's good fun. Uh, I've done conventions with Danielle before. And I've done conventions with Joanna before. I've done conventions with Kimmy Robertson, who was Kathy, mm -hmm. doing the QED report. Um, and this, we just need to get uh, David Duchovny to come on out and for, you know, <laughs> exactly. Bruce, head inventory clerk. I, I think he'd probably do it. Um, he pinned me down on the set. Uh, he was brand new in the industry. He hadn't done Red Shoe Diaries. He hadn't done Files. And uh, David Duchovny pinned me down at lunch on the steps of my trailer. And he's like, how do you get a better agent? How do you get better parts? How do you? I'm, I told him, I'm like, oh, you do this, you do this, you hustle this way. And he's like, okay, got it. And then I remember a year later, I was reading for Red Shoe Di Diaries. And I'm like, I'm totally wrong for this. I'm a nerd. And he gets it. Um, and, he, you know, tremendous success. So he's very smart, very well read, and very focused and driven. Mm -hmm. He wanted to do this. And he, he kept asking people. And I'm kind of one of those people that will tell people how to do it. So... Yeah. That was weird. Well, I, I think he owes you at least 15% of his career now. But yes, convention, New Jersey, come. Absolutely. Be a part of it. Horicon is an annual event. Actually, they're going to do two in the matter of just a couple of months because they're trying to make up for because they couldn't do it last year. So I'm looking forward to the September session. They'll have a December session. Go to Horicon.com. Find out more in Atlantic City and spend some time with the, uh, the reunited bunch of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, which... By the way, I got to say this. I think a lot of the success of that film came after the box office because I can just pretty much predict for years TBS would just run this over and over again. So I think it gained more life after sure. the being in the box office than, you know, cable television definitely was a real bonus for you guys on that. It was. It seemed to be programmed on HBO for the summers, and mm -hmm. it would just start playing um, and uh, year after year. it. I feel that for some people, it never had a chance to slip into nostalgia because of that. Right. Um, it Like, they'd always kind of been in touch with it for some reason. It's a quirky movie that has a little bit of something. If you're not a girl coming of age dealing with, you know, feminine power in the workforce, then maybe you'll identify with Kenny, you know, or Zach or, or the clown dog kid or something. There's something in it for everybody. It's true. And funny enough with Don't Tell Me Baby Series, I've worked on some important after school specials about McCarthyism or, you know, organic uh, fruit growing. I've worked on, you know, uh, uh, battered with Mike Farrell about domestic abuse. Right. But the movie that seems to have changed more people's lives is Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's <laughs> Dead. I would get letters, notes online, go to autograph conventions and people would come up to me and say, hey, I have to tell you, I was laying about doing nothing and I watched Don't Tell Mom and I'm like, I like to cook. I joined a culinary academy, and now I'm a head chef at a five-star resort in Miami. Oh, my God. So I somehow, Don't Tell Mom has actually trans transformed people's lives for the better. So that's fantastic. That's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I never would have expected that. And by the way, since you mentioned um, our hot dog man, um, I'd be remiss not to say the name Josh Charles, who, by the way, 
The Good Wife on CBS alone. I mean, great actor, a Dead Poet Society, um, tremendous guy. I know he's a big time Baltimore Ravens fan. I, I, I had the chance to interview him once before. Very interesting guy. Here with Keith Coogan on the A game. As we're talking about Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, give me a, a photo here, Christian. Go to number five. Now, if you are a fan of the movie, obviously, this is Keith's this is Keith's line in the movie. There's no doubt about it. And this is kind of cool. This is a nice little ornament. Um, if you go to his website, KeithCooganOnline.com, and you click on the merchandise button, this is one of the many things he's got available. It's a, it's a kind of a cool thing. It may be early to talk about Christmas, but it's never too early to basically say, hey, look, if you're looking for something early, this is a nice little tchotchke. And uh, you've become a business unto yourself. I visited the website. I mean, you really have embraced that, that tagline and kind of said, you know what? If you love it, here, let's go after it, and you can have some stuff. I Yes, I was very lucky with uh, uh, the line, as I, me and my wife like to call it. Um, and everybody has it. Uh, I was going to a, a screening of Clockwork Orange, and Malcolm McDowell was being interviewed by, um, 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 oh, God. Anyway, uh, but uh, in it, they asked him about singing in the rain, and he got up out of his chair during the Q&A, and Malcolm McDowell starts doing the singing in the rain bit from um, from Clockwork Orange. And my wife goes, that's his dishes that they're do are done, man. And and so, and, and honestly, Joanna Cassidy says that she gets hit up for I'm Right on Top of That Rose, referenced more than Dolores in Roger Rabbit, more than Zora in Blade Runner. And that's phenomenally significant. The, the dialogue is fantastic. The writers wrote every line together, in the room together, and would talk it back and forth and every other line in Don't Tell Mom is quotable. Once you start, you can just keep going through the scene and you keep running into these great one-liners. That's true. So very lucky, and I was super lucky that even if you didn't get a chance to see Don't Tell Mom in the theater or later in its subsequent runs on cable, um, that it the line tagged the trailer. It was at the very end of the trailer, and they played that trailer to death for the VHS release and for the original theatrical release. So even people that had the movie knew the line. So I'll, I'll run with that. My, my whole goal in life as an actor is to work hard and do more movies and maybe maybe get another line. If not, I'm good with that one. It'll be on my headstone. Here lies Keith <laughs> Coogan. The dishes are done, man. <laughs> Well said, my friend. And the line, by the way, did have a nice little reboot. Every play on words I can possibly put there because of uh, a certain Kevin Smith movie. Um, seeing that pop up obviously brought a smile to my face, for sure. And it, it's interesting because we showed a photo earlier, you and your wife, with the Star Wars shirts on. And we know that Kevin Smith is like a huge Star Wars guy. So... I would imagine there was a little bit of bonding even before you did your uh, little scene for the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. But again, love to see the line pop up the way it did. Yeah, I love it. I know that when I do um, a series, web series, like the one I just did in uh, Jersey, um, that often people would like me to kind of work that in somehow, especially if it's, you know, looser and you can kind of go wink wink hey it's you know <laughs> keith coogan remember the line and um i that's fantastic i freaking love it <laughs> and i'll find a million different ways to reference it i'm sure um so yeah very 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 happy with it and uh yeah, I'm just I'm stoked. I'm glad it wasn't like Thor's a homo or some racist. Oh like yeah, that would that would have been bad. It'd be very very bad. No, that would not be good. <laughs> oh god, uh, Keith Coogan here on the A game. Uh, before we get to random shots, one more thing I do want to mention. Um, he was doing something during the quarantine. A lot of us were getting into podcasting and doing some crazy stuff, but um, he found time to do something a little different. Uh, give me photo eleven, please, and that would be the quarantine bunch and that. Got um, Keith reunited with a couple of uh, former child stars like Judy Norton from The Waltons and Danny Pignatoro from Who's the Boss, Scotty Schwartz, A Christmas Story. Um, was that a fun thing to do, especially when there was not really anything you could do? Because we know Hollywood had shut down. There really wasn't much you could do. So to have at least that outlet was like, oh, okay, I got this going. And, and I kind of feel like, all right, I can be entertaining or at least have this thing going while I'm waiting for the next thing or for, basically for Hollywood to open up properly. Yeah, you know, as an artist, you're going to want to make a comment or try to help people cope with what's going on. It's often what I think movies are great at. Yeah. I've, there's many times in my life 
whenever I see a movie uh, rerun on the cable. I remember what house problem I was running from when I ran to the theater at 16 to go see it. I'm like, hey, I should have been doing Christmas shopping. And I said, I saw Supergirl. But I remember that every time Supergirl airs. Um, yeah, so, so strange. Uh, I'm a big fan of movies. So I, you know, we love, my wife, she loves to get selfies with people. Uh, she's thousands of them. And I, you know, I, whenever I work, work with people, even I'm like, kind of like, oh my God, uh, you know, how cool, like how cool to get Dean McDermott and Danny Mentaro, Jeremy Miller, yeah. um, Scotty Schwartz. These are all friends. Judy Norton, of course, my co-star from Walton. Uh, funny thing is quarantine bunch is based on a real group. Uh, there's a Facebook group, uh, ex child star, uh, secret society. And there's about 400 of us and from Broadway to music to, you know, theater companies, uh, commercials, uh, movies, TV, uh, you just had to have made money as a kid actor. And then you could have a group of people that maybe you can talk to each other. Right. Cause most people are like, Oh, former child star problems, but there could be, you know, what kind of, what ulcers did you have at 12? And then people can talk about their medical exactly. conditions from the stress of working as a child actor. I loved it. The only stress was not working for right. me. Whenever I was on a set, I was just pleased as punch. I loved working. Um, but you can't always be working. And uh, and my grandfather taught me about the cyclical industry. He's this huge star at five with the kid and Charlie Chaplin. And yeah, he continued to work in his career, but really nobody really remembers anything but Adam's family 50 years later. Um, so, uh, oh, so Quarantine Bunch that we would meet for real at different child stars' houses. Wow. And be you know, laughing and dancing and eating and actually playing. We'd have um, a DJ play all the theme songs from the TV shows. <laughs> and if you were in the theme song, you get up and dance. Um, but when, when quarantine happened, we couldn't have these parties anywhere. We couldn't meet. And so the conceit of the series is it actually was a real group. Um, and uh, we decided to kind of mock it up. And then you have Debbie Tar from Tarzana who crashes it. She's a stalker fan of mine. <laughs> And in an anti-comedy way, she takes over the series, kind of boots us all off of our own show. So it's a really <laughs> wacky. It was actually created me, Jeff McIntyre, who I went to junior high with, uh, and uh, Ryan Paul James, who uh, wrote it. We, um, I've done a couple of projects with him. It, it, it came, I had a 50th birthday party, and I had a lot of other friends and former child stars there. And we're talking, and like, we should do something. And, um, and coronavirus hit, uh, you know, and yeah. so by April... We were itching to do something. So, yeah, go ahead. And, it's at thequarantinebunch.com. It's got a weird built-in universe. So if you go to the website, read comments, look at some of the promotions on Facebook, there's another you know joke within a joke within a joke within a joke. I, I love it. It's weird. It's not what I expected, but that's kind of why I really love it. That's cool. And definitely check it out. On, uh, check it out the website. Check it out on Facebook. And, Keith, uh, I was going to mention your grandfather, but since you already brought him up, and you brought up something that I wanted to bring up. I want Photo 17 up here. Since you mentioned Chaplin, you mentioned The Kid, this year is actually the 100th anniversary of the film The Kid. Um, such such a great film that Chaplin did. And to think about it, here it is 100 years later. And by the way, that is his grandfather on the right, the young little yeah. kid. That is Jackie Coogan. Who, and your grandfather went on to do Tom Sawyer. He went on to do Oliver Twist. And yes, you're right. Most people do remember him as Uncle Fester from the Adams family. That may be one generation, or I'd say most generations remember that. But anybody who's an aficionado with Chaplin knows the kid. And then the other major contribution he did, um, 1935, 1936, the Coogan Law came into effect because your grandfather unfortunately did not get to keep a lot of his money due to things that happened and then this law kind of really became a, a help to young actors in the future yeah the, the coogan act um i think uh i think they pegged it at 38 it was actually drafted within 48 hours after he lost the trial and lost all of his money to his mother. Wow. There was a terrible car wreck which killed his father probably when he was around 20. Mm -hmm. And his father had always promised a million-dollar ironclad trust fund for him. Well, my great-grandmother had remarried the business manager. They spent right through the money. My grandfather was marrying Betty Grable. And he's like, let's get that money. She's like, yeah, let's get that money. And my great grandmother said, what money? You know, you're not deserved anything. You were a kid. You were having fun. You were playing. It's not your money. And as a matter of fact, California law was right. A minor's earnings or community property in the household. And the parents have a discretion to spend it. So everyone was pretty upset about that. He was a beloved adopted orphan 
the world adopted this orphan after World War One. Um, perfect actor at the right place at the right time. He formed he formed a production company at six, and then signed a you know million dollar contract with MGM, a uh, four picture deal, with a five hundred thousand dollar signing bonus. An Olympic an Olympian was his swimming instructor, and he would learn chess from grandmasters. And I always thought my family was making things up or kind of blowing it up. And then I'd see pictures or read stories and go, oh, they weren't, they weren't lying. He was wow. really like the biggest star in the world. There's a great picture of him with Rudolph Valentino and Douglas Fairbanks. And uh, I see this picture and I notice that my grandfather's in costume. He's got his the hat on, you know, and the suspenders and everything. And I'm like, is he doing a press thing? What is this? And my family said, oh, no, they came and visited Jack on his set. Oh, wow. And they were the three top box office stars of that year. So I can't even imagine, especially when Hollywood was so young that you had Harold Lloyd, yeah. Buster Keaton, and Charlie Chaplin. That's really all, you know what I mean? Like there was there were 17 people that made movies. If you're one of those 17 <laughs> people back then, I think it carried a, a heck of a lot of weight. Um, but then my grandfather got to see it change into talkies. Tom Sawyer was mm -hmm. his first talkie. Right. Uh, and he got to see color and then TV invented. I got to start my career in analog in the 70s with film. Even television was shot in film, right. most of it. But then I got to see digital, and I got to see Netflix. You know, yeah. iTunes kind of took out, or Napster took out the music industry. I got to see Netflix kind of work on the way that we make and distribute movies. You've seen Kevin Smith uh, tackle that head on yes. with Reboot, how he financed that, how he got it done and, right. and distributed. So uh, I, I love to think that my family, because my great grandparents started in vaudeville. So from vaudeville to silence, to talkies, mm -hmm. to, to TV, to, uh, to now, to the web, the way that the web's working. So I'm very proud of the lineage. And now every single child that does work in the industry is protected. They've got uh, uh, working hour restrictions, supervision. They've got, um, you know, there's always a social worker on set. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, and then the money is predicted. Fifteen percent of their earnings are put aside into a block trust account. It was done by honor system prior to two thousand, and still children are having problems. So in two thousand, California changed it to Coogan accounts that have to be opened, and production has to cut two checks. One for the fifteen percent goes into a private block trust account that no one can touch. <laughs> And then the parents get the other 85%. But don't forget, you got taxes and agents and managers and PR and all that stuff. Of so 15% is about right for the kid. Um, so yeah, incredibly proud of that. And I have people that come up to me and go, hey, I just turned 18 and I got my money. And that, that means a lot to me. So we didn't necessarily get the money, our money, but uh, I'm glad that everyone else is uh, getting theirs. One more thing I do want to ask you about your grandfather, and then we'll go on to random shots, because you did have a, a time where you could, were growing up and he was in your life. Did he ever give you any really good advice as you were embarking on this acting thing? Because as you know, as we said, your grandfather started as a child. So, I mean, the interesting, the parallels that are going on here, what advice did he that you remember that he gave you? Watch your money. And be careful of mothers. <laughs> he would not help with auditions. He said, that's my game to do. I came to him with the Tom Sawyer. Disney's doing a new Tom Sawyer. Right. And I'm like, hey, you did this part, you know, 29 million years ago. Would you help me with it? And he goes, no, I'm not going to help you with it. Wow. Because that's your thing. That's your part. That's your choices. You can't, you know, I can tell you how to be on time to the audition. That's what he told me. Be a professional. Know your stuff. Be on time. Don't bump into the furniture. Uh, don't burn bridges. It's way too hard to build bridges in this town. Never burn a bridge and never turn down work. My oh. grandfather says never turn down work. Mm -hmm. So what? You made a flop. You learned something from it, I'm mm. sure. And you got paid. So he just never turned down work. I think that's the one thing that every actor has said. If you've been in the business long enough and you've had success, you're going to have a flop somewhere along the way. And I think that's great advice. You have to learn something from the flop and say, okay, what did I do in this that I can take out of this, channel into the next project, and do it better. You know, because it's not sometimes it's not the actor's fault. Sometimes you're sitting there going, well, I'm acting these words. I mean, ah. Despite that, sometimes you can bring great work. My mom, who she takes care of the estate and watches all the residuals and, like, gets paid for anything that, you know, name and license of my grandfather's stuff. She's late at night and she's working on something. She hears my grandfather's voice. Mm -hmm. ah, ah, his little Uncle Fester voice. She hears him, but she looks over and he's got this weird 
hair going on. It's incredibly intense. And she, what is this movie? And it was Amazon women um, from on the Mars moon? or the tarantula women. I, <laughs> spider women from Mars. Okay. And, she, and it was the worst beam. He was Dr. Tarantula who <laughs> created spider women. And um, he's amazing in it. He's completely committed. He's out of his mind. He's so <laughs> focused. You're like, this is some of his best work, and it's in the crappiest movie. So sometimes being in something low budget or whatever frees you up because you're just not worried. You're like, no one's going to see this. Mm -hmm. They're going to read the credit. Oh, he's working. Good. But nobody's going to see it. So, yeah. Oh, I answer the phone. Hello, this is Keith. I'll do it. I think that's a good segue to talk about, even though I was going to bring it up a little later, your connections to Jersey recently because, uh, yeah, I, and if I, if I don't give shout-outs to Troy Burbank, Ernie O'Donnell, and my dear friend Brian O'Halloran, I probably will not be able to show up in the next poker tournament that they will be having. So with that being said, um, you came out to Jersey and actually decided to uh, help out on an episode of the project that they were working on. So I think you defend your point of saying, hey, you call me, and it's like, I'll read it if I like it. Okay, I'm coming out. Let's do it. I hadn't even read anything, and I said <laughs> yes. <laughs> even better. <laughs> That's great. And obviously, Ernie had a cameo in Jay and Silent Bob as well. And, um, I mean, coming out here to Jersey to do that, I saw some photos you know, on Facebook. It looked like you were having a good time being out here too. So, But I can tell just by looking at your demeanor here. You're oh, somebody he's a great actor. Ernie, Ernie's, Ernie's. I think he's going to be an even better producer and writer in the future. I really do believe that about Ernie. But just looking at your whole demeanor, it's like you seem to embrace just you're embracing life and you're embracing having fun with what you're doing and where you're going in your life right now. Yeah. Um, you know what? I would get kind of butt hurt. People go, "Oh, you don't do any movies anymore." I'm like, "Well, I do. You just don't see them. I mean, they're you know, you got to hunt for them practically. <laughs> One of them's only in German. You know, Region B DVD." Um, but I love it. And I love working. And so you gotta, you look, I have people that ask me, Hey, whatever happened to Elizabeth Shue? Is she working? And I'm like, she's on CIS for six years. She's on this other show. Have you seen the boys? What are you talking about? Not, there's too much product. Not everybody sees everything, but that's the great thing is there are audiences. You make something and it talks to people. They will buy it. They'll follow you. They will support. They're like this is something unique because I found shows like I'm Sorry or American Housewife that are just gems on yeah. television and people I ask they go I don't know I didn't know anything about this show <laughs> so I stopped getting bitter and there's a there's a difference between someone going oh do you still act and oh do you, you know you still at it you still doing it I totally get that my grandfather had a great response anytime when someone said to him hey when was the last time you did a movie my grandfather would say when was the last time you did a movie so I don't try to come off as cocky as my grandfather. I don't have as much work to pull that off. Um, but I totally understand where they're coming from. Trust me. No one wants to see Keith Coogan in movies more than Keith Coogan. Uh, except maybe my wife. Uh, so I totally support the fans that want, want to see that. I would love to do that. Um, I'm also terribly stubborn. I learned my comic timing from my grandfather. He learned it from Chaplin. And I know comedy kind of comes around and goes and styles change but at one point it's going to come back to what i do so hey <laughs> watch out <laughs> keith coogan's here on the a game up to the random shot segment uh being sponsored by my friends at ross brewing whose uh new uh brew is called twist of fate it is a sour ipa but don't let sour fool you it is fruity it's tart and you can go to rossbrewing.com and find out more about the new brews that they are developing thank you for coming on keith these questions can come from pretty much anywhere. I basically am admitting the fact that I'm a social media stalker, and this is where I come up with these questions. So with that being said, I'm going to start with photo number eight. This was a recent one that came out of your Instagram. From the coffee mug that says, Coffee does so much for us and asks nothing in return. It is so true. I share a passion of coffee just like you do because I'm noticing you are drinking coffee. So how much do you drink as far as coffee on a daily basis? Three cups. Plus, like, 17 gallons of Coca-Cola. I don't know. Maybe some Red Bull. I'd live on caffeine and sugar. Why? What's it to you? <laughs> all, of it, all the coffee. There you go. I got nothing. Moving right along. I, you know, what's it to me? Hey, more power to you, brother. Stay fueled. Better living through caffeine. Um, 
Now, I noticed that photo. I think it was t the credits were taken from a Denny's. Um, but you're also recently out in Jersey, which is like right. diner capital of the world. So if you had your choice between, let's say, a Denny's, let's say you're out in the southern part of the United States in a Waffle House or a Jersey style diner, pick one of the three. Where are you going to and why? Waffle House, Waffle House, Waffle House, Waffle House. Man after my own heart. Give me scattered, smothered, double covered, and capped. I don't need to justify it. Waffle House. <laughs> <laughs> Any true aficionado of the Waffle House will have at least tried the hash browns with the works at some point. Where else can you see a woman with one flip flop and three teeth and she's your server? <laughs> <laughs> I am just going to say, thank God I did not have anything because that would have just spit out my nose like in about two seconds. <laughs> plus, plus, Waffle House acts as a national alert system. So if you try to go to a Waffle House and it's closed, there's probably a tornado coming. <laughs> I think you're right on that one. <clears throat> All right, now I need to clear my throat. Okay. Mm. Random shots with Keith Coogan. Okay, um, I need photo number seven as I'm trying to catch myself here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the moment from the 1989 Oscars. And uh, not only were well, there you were center stage, but there was another part of that performance. And I believe, I'm trying to figure out what photo was that. Um, that was the, scroll down, I believe that's down. I'm trying to find it now. Uh, no, scroll up. And give me number three. That's the one I need. There we go. Yeah, which, by the way, impressive dance move you had there, Mr. Coogan, looking back on that moment. But my question to you on this is, since this was this dance number about uh, the future of acting, can you name as many as you can the other actors that were on stage with you that night? Patrick Dempsey, Christian Slater... Savion Glover, Blair Underwood, Tracy Christine Nelson, mm -hmm. Trisha and Jolie Fisher. Uh, you had Ricky Lake. Yep. Corey Feldman. Mm -hmm. You had Chad Lowe mm -hmm. and his brother conveniently did one other number that year. The only other number in the Oscars that year, the Snow White debacle. Ah. So thankfully... The Snow White thing took all the press and nobody even noticed the silly dances we were doing. But it was choreographed by Kenny Ortega. And I know I forgot Matt Latanzi. I forgot um, who else. There's oh, uh, um, uh, there's another junior. Um, it was mostly people that were related to or progeny of Hollywood or, mm -hmm. or like careers were blowing up or were known for dance or had worked with Kenny Ortega. Right. I got booked because I was doing an AM Los Angeles promoting Cousins. And because of a little dance sequence I do to Love Man with Lloyd Bridges and Cousins, right. uh, assistant to Kenny Ortega was watching that morning and goes, hey, aren't we casting for dancers that are related to famous Hollywood people? And they called me up and said, would you do the Oscars? Weeks of rehearsals. Um, and, uh, and then we went up live and they go, by the way, um, tonight is the first night we've opened it up to the Soviet bloc. So there will be 1 billion people watching live. Wow. Uh, don't panic. Have fun. So that was a night to remember. To say the least. And I love the advice. Yeah. Don't panic. You know, billion people. It's not a big deal. Don't panic. Sure. Random shots with Keith Coogan. Um, give me photo number four, if you would. And this kind of ties into something I was saying earlier. This is actually a photo that happened recently. This is uh, Keith uh, right here with uh, my man Troy Burbank, um, recently doing some uh, shooting of a pilot that hopefully will be picked up featuring Troy, Ernie O'Donnell, Brian O'Halloran. Um, but I'm noticing, I'm like, okay, this looks like, Either this is a power or there's actually, there was actually a poker tournament going on. I'm not sure, but the question is, are you a poker player? I am. I was just playing poker last night. Um, <laughs> I am. I don't really do tournaments. Uh, I was in the Ed Asner tournament a few years ago and um, got down to kind of another table and, and, and lasted a few rounds. And then they, like, bumped something. And it was funny money, and I knew I was, I knew I was toast. So... <laughs> I just was bluffing the hell out of Ed Asner. And Ed Asner looks at me, and I see this look in his eye, and he goes, 
He's like, you're full of shit. And I knew it. He could, I mean, he's a, a really seasoned actor and I'm sure he looks at a guest star and he's like, this guy's got it or this guy does. He looked at me. He's like, you don't have the nut. And, and he took like 10,000 of fake money. It was like donation, fake money or right. something. Um, so yeah, I got called on my bullshit by Ed Asner. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I love playing cards. I just love the fun of it. I play the people, not the cards. If you get good cards, that's great. Um, I like to bluff with good cards. That's, mm. that's um, tight and aggressive. And I like to bluff with something in my hand. All right. Well, that means the next time you're in Jersey, I am calling out the entire crew there. I'm calling out Ernie. I'm calling out Troy. I'm calling out Brian. I'm like going, if there is not a poker event going on, well, I should explain. Ernie's still pissed off at me. He's invited me to two poker events, and I've made money both times. He's not happy with the fact that I've won money. I, it's God's honest truth. He's been a guest on my show, but he's still not happy that I won money. Go figure. Come on, come on. It's donation. It's charity. What are you walking away? These little kids, you're taking food out of their mouths. Hey, you know, I am charity. Come on, I'm an unemployed radio guy. Give me a break. <laughs> All right, Keith. Um, when it comes to Marvel or DC, where do you lean? Oh, uh, Marvel, because I, um, when we were living on a converted porch in Topanga Canyon in Malibu, uh, it was a weed dealer's house and he had a drawer that had uh, Iron Man and uh, Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. So I got particularly of my first things were Iron Man. I was like, what is this? This is amazing. And funny how like literally nobody really even cared about Iron Man until the movie came out. Right. I was like, oh, my God, why? They're picking Iron Man? This is great. <laughs> uh, but I love Fantastic Four because I loved when they fought with Spidey. There was nothing better than seeing Torch and Spidey go at it. And I had a great uh, little anthology. It was a small book, but it had Spidey against Rhino, Mysterio, uh, uh, Kingpin. And so every single bad guy, Vulture, were all in this. So I just, I love Spider-Man. And I did a recent bump on ABC promoting the Marvel Land and everything. Yes. And, you know, although I've had my run-ins with Thor, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, my favorite superhero is Spider-Man because mm -hmm. he... You know, he fights crime. He gets good grades in school, takes care of his Aunt May, and he's got the job. Very important. I like that. That's very good. And I, I understand Thor. So, um, Christian, photo 14, I'd be remiss not to bring up Vincent D'Onofrio and his love of Thor in Adventures in yeah. Babysitting. Oh, my God, how young he looked there. I mean, and by the way, my, my uh, producer, Christian, was like, he saw the photo beforehand, and he's going... I didn't even know that was Vincent D'Onofrio. I'm like going, yeah, D'Onofrio couldn't shave at that point, but that's another issue altogether. I mean, but everybody was young in that movie, even him. But God, he yeah, was he was he was just six months off of shooting uh, Full Metal Jacket, yeah, uh, which came out while we were doing the press tour with Adventures of Babysitting. Oh, so wow. because our uh, turnaround time was so short on Adventures of Babysitting, both movies came out within a few weeks of each other. And so it was weird. Me and Anthony Rapp were in Salt Lake City on a press tour, and we went to go see Full Metal Jacket. We're like, hey, Vincent's in it. Let's go see it. And we're just like, that guy could have killed us any moment. In Lower Wacker Drive, we'd be dead. No one would have found us. <laughs> um, and, and he was intense. I have to admit, he's a sweetheart. He's a big marshmallow. Yes. But he just come off a pretty serious picture. True. And he's kind of a heavy, and he wouldn't break a lot. He stayed kind of mysterious and Thor-like. Uh, but I kept picking him. What's it like to work with Kubrick? But you know, do, do multiple takes. What's the thing? And he's like, yeah, he goes, it's rough. You do a lot. You know, he wants to get it right. He's not in the room. And I said, what? Because Chris Columbus is like there. Right. Joel Schumacher would be under the camera lying on a Fernie pad. Wow. Dan Petrie's in there with guns and like just loving. And I've seen directors that are very with you. They don't even look through the lens yeah. or look at the mind. They just watch the actors. And they're like, that's the one. So um, Kubrick is in another room watching on a monitor giving no direction uh -huh. go again go again go again he goes eventually they'll learn their lines mm -hmm. eventually they'll get all the props right eventually camera will get it right and i'll know it when i see it go again right go again go again wow and sometimes sometimes they said hey man sometimes it works out you get it in two three takes and everyone's like yeah we're moving on and then also actors tend to elaborate if there was 30 takes, they're going to say it was 80. And so Kubrick has this huge reputation. But I loved it because I just love filmmakers and filmmaking. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good treat. It's amazing how many cast members from Adventures in Babysitting continued character actors yeah. and just continued with work after that. Uh, since we're back on Adventures in Babysitting, I forgot to m uh, mention Chris Columbus. And I, I, I meant to ask you, that was like the first film Chris directed. And then he exploded 
after that as a director. Was there any indication, even at a young age, when you're working with him, that you knew there was like, this guy's going to be big? Yeah, Goonies, Gremlins, and Young Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. He already had those under his belt as a writer. I right. think he had story credit on Reckless, but he may be removed. I don't know. He wrote Reckless or did something with Reckless. Mm -hmm. He, um, you know, New York film student. He, uh, maybe Columbia f f School. He really was a Spielberg protege at that point, right? He mm -hmm. hadn't worked with John Hughes yet. Right. After that, he had his sophomore slump with Heartbreak Hotel. Everyone involved is like, yeah, right, Heartbreak Hotel, got mm -hmm. it. You know, it's a cute little picture, but it didn't bring the box office like they thought. But that was a good test for Chris because they're like, all right, we'll give him another picture and another picture. And right. then you start hitting with Home Alone, yeah, record box office, record legs. Mm -hmm. That thing was in theater for three years. Yeah. It came out like at a Christmas, then it went into the next year yeah. and was still in theaters the following year. It's true. Uh, and then you have the Harry Potter. And I was always kind of bitter. I was like, you know... Well, you could have called us. I mean, you know, Harry <laughs> Potter or something, but he'd made that agreement with J.K. Rowling right. to only cast British actors. Right. So I know that's why. That's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris was a kid, uh, he, but he, he also was working with a great crew, Ralph Bode, who shot it. Um, great Eye, we were working with a Panavision Platinum camera, which was brand new. Us and Inter Inter um, Interspace were the first films to get these Panavision Platinum cameras. They just look beautiful. They have this great grain and soft kind of look to them. Um, there's just some, And it looks great. If you see a Blu-ray of Adventures of Babysitting, you just go, it looks like it was shot today. Yeah. Um, so once we got started and... You know, everyone saw the first couple of days of work. I mean, it, it wasn't easy. It was ambitious. The first day, we're strapping $250,000 cameras to the side of, you know, tow vehicles and rigs. We're in that truck with handsome John Pruitt. And um, we, one of the mounts came loose and we almost lost a camera. We almost, we almost went $250,000 over budget on our first day. Yeah, that, that would be Everything was good. saved. Um, studio notes were like, why is Maya Bruton laughing during the sequence? And Chris Columbus says, because it's in the script. She's supposed to be enjoying all of this, like a thrill ride. And they mm -hmm. went, oh, okay, she can stay. He's like, well, yeah, she's going to, yeah, screw off. <laughs> um, he knew exactly what movie he was making. It was heavily storyboarded. Right. And we started rehearsing. We did two weeks of rehearsal, by the way. And a lot of improv during rehearsals, which later was incorporated in the script. We didn't improv on the set. We did come up with fresh bits on the set. Okay. Um, but it was very inclusive. So all of us had a part in kind of helping build our characters and the story and, and just make it fun and believable. And Over the Top had just come out. And I think we saw it, or it was so infamously bad. And he that was his code word. He'd go, cut, OTT. And we, oh, Over the Top? It's too much. <laughs> he goes, yes, get it grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. I want stakes, but keep it real. That was his whole thing, is dialing it right into that little kind of fun spot. Mm -hmm. So anytime you hear OTT, you just go, oh, damn, that was too much. <laughs> I would have He's a great director. And he's so supportive. He gave us our our wrap gift from Chris were Spectra Polaroid cameras with some film. Mm -hmm. And these are nice, you know, kind of a wider screen. I think they'd been using them for make, hair and makeup and wardrobe on the shoot. Right. Because they were kind of new for Polaroid. I remember taking that to Africa and taking pictures in Africa with it. That was a nice gift nice. From, uh, from Chris. And then Disney Pop for... A day at Disneyland for the cast and a hundred dollar gift certificate shopping. Nice. Yeah, it was fun to support that. Um, Chris was. He went on a press tour with Maya. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Shue went on a press tour by herself, mm -hmm. and then me and Anthony Rapp paired up. And right. there were some cities, big cities. We'd all come together: New York, Atlanta, whatever, and we'd all kind of see each other. Hey, what's up? And it was eleven cities in nine days to promote. Adventures of Baby. We were talking radio at 5 a.m., mm -hmm. TV stations, boom, throughout the day, yeah. a lunch with 16 different press people, mm -hmm. day after day yeah. after day. And I'm like, I got, I loved it. Had another one for Cousins, had another one for Toy Soldiers. Right. And uh, miss those. I miss when they had nice big press junkets. <laughs> the future, we don't know. We don't know. Cousins was smart. Instead of going around to every city. They sent airplane tickets in a nice hotel for Vancouver and had their premiere in Vancouver where it was shot. Nice. Get out of a three-day weekend with food and fun. And <laughs> there's Isabella Rossellini. Hey, look, Billy Peters. Have fun with Ted Danson. Nice. Boosion and smoosion. We got the best reviews you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Bought and paid for. <laughs> but during the premiere at that 
junction junk for junket for cousins. Lloyd's sons had never visited the set, only Mama, his okay. wife. So we knew Mama, there's Mama, she took care of Lloyd and stuff. And were but were his family, his whole family <laughs> had come for the premiere in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. So I'm like mutts messing around and I'm going to go down to the lobby and go out and, you know, see what's going on in the party. And I get in the elevator and it's Bo and Jeff Bridges with Lloyd and mom. Oh my God. And what's great is Lloyd gets, Lloyd's in like this and his sons are behind him with their hands like this across like this, like, yes, dad, I've never seen so much respect in my life. Wow. If you didn't know that there were huge movie stars, you just think those were his good boys. Right. Uh, it was, a, I was like, this is Jeff and Bo Bridges. <laughs> and so that was, that was really cool. Yeah. It's a great story. It's a great story. Now I'm bad at telling stories. I'm like, yeah, and I, I met this guy once. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. My wife's like, that's, that's your story. <laughs> okay. One last thing. And I will tie your wife back into this. Cause I'm going to go back to the photo that we started with. Christian, let's go back to the top. Let's get the Star Wars photo with your wife, Pinky, here. So, yeah. I, obviously, Star Wars fan, but this is where I'm going to uh, take umbrage with you, Mr. Coogan, because of the fact that your friendship with Will Wheaton and Star Trek. And then we must mention Anthony Rapp, who is now on Star Trek Discovery. You got ties to Star Trek. So, you understand where I'm going? I can understand why you're a Star okay, Wars fan. I read- once I think I had one good solid audition for Next Generation and it was for a five of eight or a six of nine or a seven of two or some crap like that. Right. It was a board. <laughs> uh, auditioning for a board. Okay. And I'm in the office with all the Star you know, Star Trek crap around there. <laughs> and I'm I'm frankly I'm a, I'm a Star Wars guy. But I love Trek and I love OTS. I watched all the OTS. I could tell you from the first frame I got I know which show which one I can tell you the star date. I know all of the locations that they use in LA and mm-hmm. you know, everything. I love Star Trek, but uh, I was bitter about not ever getting on the show. Okay. Um, and then, you know, they had iterations, and I loved Voyager, and I loved Enterprise. You know, I mean, I loved each of the kind of the Bacula one. I forget if that was that Enterprise. And um, I got really pissed because I wanted to support Anthony so bad, but I didn't have CBS All Access. So <laughs> oh. I understand they've now turned into Paramount Plus, mm-hmm, yes. and they've got a big promotion, and so that's a little more attractive to sign up for. But <laughs> I, it was hard to see it. I'd have to wait to it sometimes it would be on like two weeks later it would actually broadcast an air on CBS but I could never really get into the show um I really loved the first uh two or three that I'd seen and just never you know I don't know got busy I couldn't catch up I would you know I love it I love good sci-fi honestly um Seth MacFarlane's show was the best Star Trek done recently oh his spoof oh my god that was good it wasn't even a spoof what was so great was it it would spoof and joke and poo poo and pee pee yeah. and sex jokes. And then about seven minutes into an episode, the sci fi element kicks in. You go, this is a great plot. And then it goes a little further. And then you forget. Mm-hmm. You're about 20 minutes in and you're fully invested. And then Seth pulls a freaking pee pee joke and thing. And you go, <laughs> oh, you got me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so there were parts of his show that were some of the best Star Trek episodes made. <laughs> but it pissed me off because he pulled off the sci fi so well. Right. You go, oh, but it's just this silly show. <laughs> now I understand. When you put it in those terms, I have to say, no problem. Because I think I would feel Did the same see- way. Did you see the Scott Grimes episode where he finds the girl's phone? No, I didn't see that one, unfortunately. So they find some, like, Earth stuff Mm -hmm. or a shuttle, and it's got a girl's phone Mm -hmm. from the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And it's got her Instagram posts and her Facebook stuff and her life, Mm -hmm. her pictures. And in this hour episode, by the way, it's one of some of Scott Grimes' best work. I'm so friends with Scott for years. Mm -hmm. He falls in love with this girl through her phone wow and then the computer of the ship says i can bring her to you for a, a minute kind of like a um ai you know, yeah. at the end of ai like for one thing we can recreate her or whatever right. and it is scott's best work it is it is fantastic it is one of the best sci-fi episodes i have ever seen that's and it's on something. the mcfarland show that's saying something that's saying a lot yeah. right there yeah Great way to wrap up, but I will once again mention Horicon. For those who are going to be around the Atlantic City area, may plan your vacation. Christian photo is six more more time. It will be the weekend of September 3rd, 4th, and 5th, taking place at the showboat. Jersey Horicon has been going on for years. Um, check out their website, horicon.com, and it will be a mini reunion 
of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead is Keith Coogan, Daniel Harris, and Joanna Cassidy will be coming together, signing autographs, taking pictures, the whole bit. It's cons coming back. It's great to see. Oh, by the way, njhorrorcon.com is the website to check out. I also, if I can, I do want to plug, I got uh, contacted by Mahonic Drive-In. And they're going to do an Adventures of Babysitting, Don't Tell Mom, double feature, Ooh. Q&As, signing plates, autographs, all that stuff. So it's mid-August, I think. Okay. Look up the – but the Mahonic, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming to Mahonic. Cool. Check your website, by the way, then, KeithCoogan.com. They can get – I don't really update that. Okay. Um, yeah, Twitter, all you know. The whole thing, yeah. yeah. Mahonic is coming up. Yeah. Follow yeah, – What do they got? They're going to lean to me with my 8,000 <laughs> followers. If like, you promoted them, like, you have way more for you promoted them. <laughs> We've had a couple of technical glitches, and then at the end, it all just came together. So I'm very happy about that. Keith, thank you for your patience. Thanks for your time. And I look forward to seeing you in Jersey in September. Dude, Rob, you rock. Thanks for having me on the show. Take care, guys. Rock and roll. Hey. Dishes are done, man. <laughs> with that, see you next time. All right. See you. Bye.